Welcome back to Acting with Kira. If you are new here, then hello and welcome. I'm so happy that you found this space where we discuss different genres of theatre and how to hone our craft. Now, I'm super excited to have had the opportunity to interview one of my friends, Tom, for this video. He is an associate artist for this amazing theatre company called The Wardrobe Ensemble. The Wardrobe Ensemble started 10 years ago and they create their own work. Their first show, Riot, went to The Shed at The National and one of their more recent shows, Education, 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 won a stage award for Best Ensemble and a Fringe First at Edinburgh and then went on to play at the West End. So in this interview, he gets into their devising process and how they work collaboratively to create new work. Now we also get into one of his latest projects, which is a film called Cosmos, and he discusses that transition from theater to film. So sit back, get comfortable, and enjoy the interview. And if you like, please hit that like button and subscribe to see more videos like this one. I've got some really, really cool interviews lined up for you guys. So I can't wait to share those with you too. But for now, let's get into this interview with Tom. with Kira. I am Kira and today I have Tom with me and we're going to talk about his experiences with a theatre company called The Wardrobe Ensemble. So could you introduce yourself and yes. say a bit about the theatre company? Of course. So I am Tom England. I am an associate artist of The Wardrobe Ensemble Theatre Company, which is a devising theatre company um, originally based in Bristol, um, but that tours uh, nationally. Yeah. Yeah. And so when did the wardrobe uh, ensemble start? Um, we, well, I, I wasn't there at the sort of foundation of the company as they were setting it up. I was at university and they went through a um, programme called Made in Bristol. So yeah. with the um, Bristol Bit Young Company. Yeah. Um, after, after we'd all sort of grown up and were ordinarily thinking about drama school, going to... Um, university the bristol bit ran a program called made in bristol um, which was aimed to be a uh, bridge the gap between youth theater and the professional um, theater world um, and give people an opportunity to to see or get a taste of what it might be like to be a professional actor or theater and maker. does that program still run it still runs yeah. yeah um the wardrobe ensemble were the first company to or the first group of people to ever do that program oh wow um, so it was set up Ten years ago, celebrating its tenth year this year, um, and uh, yeah, the the guys who ended up setting up the wardrobe ensemble, what we now know to be the wardrobe ensemble, the core group of the wardrobe ensemble, were the first group of people to go through that, that process. So that was in two thousand and ten, and that was such a success then because they're still working together ten years later. Yeah, yeah, and there's a number of um, number of people who've gone through that program, who've gone on to be professional actors and be part of successful theatre companies. Um, yeah, so that 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 program's sort of proven to be a really great way for yeah. young people, particularly in Bristol, to to get a taste of what it's like to be. To a give you the tools yeah. to actually create your own work rather than <clears throat> sorry, just waiting for something to come your own way because they've been so proactive. Yeah, for sure, yeah. and it's a nice, you know, it's a, it's a nice way for 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 people to to approach acting or the um, sort of life of being an actor or a theatre maker without having to go to a drama school, without having to commit to yeah. three years of their life to that thing. It's a oh, way to really get a sense. It's a year long. Uh -huh. And it's sort of linked to the young company. So I, th I think it's still run in a very similar way, actually, um, whereby you have sort of professional acting training or theatre makers, practitioners come into the Bristol of it and work with those people who are doing the Made in Bristol programme. But then as part of the Made in Bristol programme, you also work with the young company. So you help assist the oh, young company okay. sessions um, and you know, perhaps later later on in the year, lead some of those sessions. So you get experience as a um, theatre maker, but also as a, a practitioner and workshop in both leader ways. with young people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So and you're really immediately cool putting those skills into practice and getting yeah. the confidence to lead workshops. Yeah, yeah for sure. And you, I've seen it in loads of people who've been through that programme. Um, there's a woman called Julia Head who's doing a lot of theatre work in Bristol and across the country. Um, 
and just really great at what they do, really good communicators, really good with young people. Um, it's really impressive. I, mm -hmm. I look at a lot of the people who've been through that program. I could name loads, loads. Well, I could try and name loads of them. I don't know all their mm -hmm. names. But you look at what they're doing and the way that they communicate and the way that they lead workshops and do all that stuff. And it's a really, really impressive program. And they're really impressive people that they're sort of turning out. Amazing. Really cool, yeah. So, when did you become involved with the theatre company? Um, really soon after they'd established, I knew them all anyway, so I'd done, been part of the Bristol Bit Young Company um, and they'd worked with them as part of that and done all the sort of, you know, what you would traditionally associate as sort of youth theatre stuff, so I'd done a lot of that with, with all of the people who are in the wardrobe ensemble. Um, and I became involved with them um, in that first year or two of them having established themselves as a theatre company, they made a show called Riot mm. at, the end, at the end of that Made in Bristol programme. So at the end of the, Made in, the, the year of the Made in Bristol programme, you end up making a show. So you sort of aim towards creating a show. Oh. And their show was called Riot, um, which went to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival um, and then subsequently went on tour. Yeah, this is very much a success. Yeah, show, yeah, it went really well. Show, yeah, yeah, yeah. And sort of performed at the National um, Theatre. The shed. The shed, yeah. yeah. Um, so they they did really well out of that. So they had that whole sort of process. And then after they performed at the National Theatre at the Shed, they, had, they were asked by the Bristol Old Vic to do one or two. It was two nights of performances in the Old Vic studio, Bristol Old Vic studio. Um, and I was in that show. So I sort of uh -huh. was involved in that. They brought me in to replace one of the people who couldn't couldn't do that um, particular performance. So that was my sort of first involvement with the wardrobe ensemble. And then since then I've been involved with um, the sort of vast majority of their full company shows. They've yeah. made an awful lot of shows. I haven't been involved in all of them by any means, but there tends to be um, sort of, we never quite know how to describe this, but sort of central shows that the, the whole company are a part right. of. Um, and I've been being a part of the the majority if not all of those sort of whole Core company shows. things yeah yeah so um i met tom when we were both in one of what yeah, yeah. ensemble shows which is many years ago yeah. now a show called 33 yeah, yeah and um the devising process i mean that show had already been created but there were bits of it that were being tweaked and changed mm -hmm. so i want to talk about the devising process yeah, within the wardrobe sure. ensemble because it's amazing that you, all of you are such creative people um, so how do you get that openness to work together? How does it all work? Yeah. I guess the sort of foundation of it was the way that we made stuff in the young company. When we were all there, there was a real sort of ethos of collaborative devising. You know, we, as we were always super encouraged as young people to make things freely, get up on your feet very quickly, not think too much about the stuff that you're doing. Ah. Just put things into practice. That's um, a, just a great tip for anyone if you are... Because once you overthink things, nerves settle in and you, yeah. all the doubts can stop you. Say, so that's not a good idea. Yeah, for sure. And I think that happens so often. That happened, you know, it used to happen to me when I was trying to make my like, GCSE or A-level pieces. You, you get super caught up and you can end up talking about things and talk yourself out of stuff. Yes. And it was really nice at that time, at that age, to be part of something as well that was... Um, really encouraging you not to talk yourself out of ideas but to just see what works so mm. that was a sort of foundation of things and as a company we've really kept hold of that principle of just making and doing making and doing um, creating a lot of stuff and getting things up on their feet we talk about getting things up on their feet a lot mm. um, because oftentimes like you can talk about something and it sounds you know we might not be able to articulate ourselves very well I might have an idea that I can't quite explain to you Yeah. so and, and yet, when I get it up on his feet, it might be fantastic. And we might yeah. go, oh, yeah, great. And we might all bounce off of each other and it work incredibly well. Yeah. Whereby, if we'd have just sat around and spoken about it, we, we all might have completely lost confidence in it and yeah. never even tried. So. so when you are when you have an idea and you want to share it with the group, how do you do that initially? Do you explain it first or do you just say, right, I want to try something. Yeah. Can you be here? I think we sort of try to streamline that process a bit when we're making a show. We'll talk about the show. We'll do a day or two off round the table chatting about the concept and the things and the themes in the show. We'll do a lot of research, try and understand the subject material as well as we possibly can. But then as soon as we sort of start devising or say we're going to start um, moving into the sort of devising process, 
We'll just write a, a real long list and anybody can throw anything out and so say, has anybody got any ideas for scenes or things that you might want to work on? And we'll say, I don't know, I'd like to work on a scene between, in the last show we made, which was about family, we might say, I want to work on a scene between a mother and an estranged um, daughter. Mm. Um, that just has an idea and you'll just say that and that'll get written down. Someone else will say something else. I want to work, I want to work on a playground scene. Someone else might say, I want to work on, you know, the, the writing of a will. Uh, and they'll just be put out there as just seed ideas. We don't explain them too much. We just get them all written down. Um, so we end up with a huge long list of stuff. It's not exhaustive. We can always add to that at a later date, but it's just so that we've got a lot of stuff there. Mm. And then we'll say, okay, cool. Um, does anyone feel particularly strongly about any one of these? So you might say, actually, yeah, that thing I mentioned, I'd really like to work on that. And I think for it to work, I'd probably need three or four people. Does anyone else want to work with me on that? And then people say, yeah, cool. Then we'll split off. Someone's, another group might work on something else. And we'll say, okay, let's give ourselves 20 minutes. And we try and be quite strict with that. We'll give ourselves 20 minutes to come up with something. We'll then share it back as a group. Um, just so that we've created something. We'll film it so we've got a record of it. Oh, that's a great idea, yeah. And then we'll um, sort of bank them. And then we'll just go through that process an awful lot. So we'll then, in a day, when we're working efficiently and when we don't chat too much, which we can get caught up in talking a lot, um, if we don't do that too much, if we don't analyse ourselves too much, then we can probably do five or six tasks in a day and have churned out quite a lot of stuff. Um, and they might be completely separate tasks or in the next devising task after that, someone might say, oh, I really liked what you did there. Mm. got a slightly different idea for it. Um, could I work with a different group and see what we do with it? Right. So we sort of work on the principle that as soon as you've created something, it becomes collectively owned. It's not, oh, okay. it's, we're, we're not precious about that idea being my idea. It's yeah. not, um, you know, if I make a scene or write something, we work really hard not to be precious about that's my thing that no one can touch that we really love the idea that actually i'll put that out there and i don't quite know where it's going to go so by all means anyone take it and do what you want mm. with it so by the time we've made a show which is a you know a lot further down the line we won't know that we you won't be able to say that scene is the scene tom wrote everyone's had everyone's a, had a handle yeah on it, yeah which that's is cool awesome. yeah so that's such a lovely collaborative process that you have together in such an open space for you to share ideas. And how in that process do you know when a scene is fully formed? Um, I don't know that you ever really know whether it's fully formed. You can get to a point where you feel sort of satisfied with it or feel yeah. happy with it saying something, communicating something really well. Um, for me, I think it's probably different for everyone in the ensemble, but for me... I always find it quite difficult to know when that's happened because right. you sort of, because the process is quite organic and it could have started from just a little idea that you, as an individual, don't think is that great, but then someone else might have taken it on and done something that's quite cool and then you might work on it again and it get a bit better, whatever that means, and then it's quite difficult because of that process to then go, oh, well, that's finished yeah. because our process isn't really one that, we're not particularly, we are aiming at having a final product, of course we are, but we're always thinking about how to, you know, tweak something or change mm. something. And a lot of the time, even when we've got a finished, you know, we've made a show called The Last of the Pelican Daughters that we took to Edinburgh in the summer. And we're taking that on tour in spring this year. Um, and we're going to work on it again. So we'll return to it when we're rehearsing. It won't be absolutely set. There'll be aspects of it that we don't want to play with too much. But we will look at it again and we will say if we think it's right, oh, maybe let's change a bit of that dialogue or that could be tightened up and that character could be improved and lifted up and whatever. So we're, we're often always working on stuff. Mm, so um, quite a fluid process yeah, rather than end yeah, goal yeah. aimed. Yeah, I'd say so, yeah. And, you know, by virtue of making theatre and the fact that you often have, a, have to have something made by this day, by sharing a work in progress or going to Edinburgh that, yeah. or doing whatever, you end up finishing it because you have to finish. That kind of gives you the framework of yeah, yeah. kind of like the time period, the time, having yeah. that deadline. Yeah, it's really that that, that 
mean something's finished because it has to be for that thing. Yeah. But we often will have it finished for that thing and then say, okay, cool. Like, how do people feel about that? We might say, it felt good, but we still don't feel like we've really done that character justice or you know, we're not really saying what we want to say here. And all the stuff we spoke about at the start of the process, we haven't really said. Mm. People enjoyed the show, but we don't feel particularly content with the place we're at. So we'll then say, okay, cool. When we go into rehearsal next, let's have that in mind. And we'll all suggest, you know, going into rehearsals for this show with Nathan Glass of the Pelican Daughters, like I just said, Tom, who's directed it, has sent us an email, all of us a message saying, if there are things you want to work on, let's write a very clear list before we go into the rehearsal mm -hmm. room and know that those are things we want to address mm -hmm. as best we can and we'll commit some time during the rehearsal process to that. So we are generally always thinking about how we can, you know, change things or, or tighten things yeah. up. Yeah. What is it like when you share this idea or this fully formed play in the, whatever state you're currently in yeah. to the audience for the first time? Um, it's really, it's exciting that the, we will often, most of the time, most of the things that we make, we'll try and do a sort of quite a big sharing of it. So the audience are aware it's not the final, not the final thing. It's not the end. It's not the absolute show. They'll be aware of that. It will be, we've worked with the Ferment Festival in Bristol a lot which is a great festival for works in progress. So we, um, we try and share it for the first time in front of a decent audience. As Ferment Festival, you can have audiences of almost sort of 200 or 300 people, depending on what space right. you're performing wow. in. And they, they're a great way to get a sense of what the feeling is that the audience get from the show. And we, yeah. we will, they're a great barometer for where you're at. Yeah. And we found them invaluable, really. And they're so really they exciting. New, do they work when you work only in the festival? Ferment, yeah. yeah, in Ferment, yeah, oh, they okay, do. Wow. Yeah. So it's good really good. Yeah, Ferment's a great festival to, to look at. And the people who run it are really open and lo lovely people. So they're, they're great to speak to or at least look at. Yeah. Or watch some of the work at Ferment yeah. and get a sense of what kind of things are going through that festival and that's kind of nice to right have a, an environment where you can share your work without that pressure of this is finite and yeah, finished yeah. and there's still room for it to grow yeah and also a friendly audience for us Bristol is a really it always gives Home us a turf, really warm yeah. reception yeah so it's really nice for us to show it in front of an audience of people that we we don't know all of them at all and there'll be a lot of people that don't know us but it will, there will also be friends and mm. family and people who care about us and people who value the people whose opinions we really value. Um, so that's always, for us, a really good way of getting stuff in front of people. Mm. Um, and do you get direct feedback or is it often a feeling? Um, it's both. So there's, there tends to be a pretty strong feeling that we, we're all, in the wardrobe ensemble, we're all real good friends. So we... we Oftentimes we'll have a similar feeling about something. You know, we won't necessarily agree on the details of stuff, but we will generally, because we work together a lot, we'll generally have a similar sense of how something went yeah. um, or what landed well and what didn't. Um, so there'll be a feeling definitely, but as part of Furman, we'll also ask for real specific feedback. So we'll talk about questions that we want answered. Um, and they, they give out forms. Oh, wow. Know, so, yeah, That's so you, you get written feedback of this character was really cool. I don't got no idea what you're doing with that. Like, that oh, makes really? no sense. Yeah. Direct. Yeah, really feedback. direct. Amazing. And it's nice to see like anonymous feedback so you just get a load of comments. And it's funny, you know, there's a lot of stuff that you in the rehearsal room might get a sense of, is that working? Is that landing? And then, okay. and then you'll, um, you'll get some feedback that is just like... Very clear, it's not working. It's <laughs> just sort of like, okay, well, it's it's yeah, yeah, okay, good to you. know. Like, we'll change that. So. Um, so, can you describe the style of theatre that you guys make? It's very physical. Yeah, it's very physical. It's um, I always find it difficult because like physical theatre doesn't quite capture. Yeah. It. And I think probably will imply something that we're not. Yeah. Like, we're, we're definitely not a company that, you know. You only need to look at like we're not like physical theatre performers. We're not. We're good at moving, but we we're not sort of acrobats or anything. 
So that doesn't quite capture it, but it definitely is physical. It's very um, fast-paced, I would say. Mm. It's sort of... Um, we like... A thing that we, we talk about a lot is sort of exploding things out. So we, we often will work on things... Um, you know, on a narrative, but we really like to play with how you can explode out from a sort of narrative. You know? So how you might um, explode out into a, or, or you know, go out, go to a flashback, or go to a different right. period of time, or um, flash forward, or explode out of feeling. So so making a moment yeah, external. Yeah, so external. Yeah, yeah. really like. We, we love doing that, so that's where our sort of style really manifests itself in those moments. Often. And then that kind of steps away from having to live in the natural, this yeah, naturalistic yeah. world. Yeah, and we, yeah, we're always, I think it'd be fair to say, and I think everybody would, in the wardrobe or someone would say this, like we, we don't really like to be sort of tied down to a particular style, and we will always try and do new things or push ourselves in new directions, which is really exciting. Like we, we don't, we don't start off a process saying, well, our style is this, so mm. people will be expecting right. us to do this. Like, to, you know, with the show we've just made, that I mentioned a few times, we actually thought, okay, let's try and really work on our narrative. Let's really try and work on how we are writing as a collective. Let's try and improve that or work, hone that skill as best as we can um, with the sort of understanding that we can do the physical stuff mm. or we can explode moments we can work with physicality we can you know work with movement and music we know we sort of know we can do that yeah. so we try and do lots of other things yeah um to just keep learning you know which is a big thing for yeah. us like we don't want to become too static and we want people to be pleasantly surprised when they watch our yeah. stuff and think, oh, they're like trying to do something new yeah um, and it might work and it might not but there's no for us there's no real point of getting stuck in a yeah a groove too much yeah and each of the the plays that you guys have done are centered on a a theme mm -hmm. or a, an incident so there is that That's narrative yeah, yeah 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 we tend to because there's a lot of us we tend to quite like to give ourselves something quite specific or times or moments to focus on so Riot, which is the first show they made that I wasn't a part of making, they, it was about a riot in an Ikea store. 33 was about the miners who got um, trapped in Chile, um, the Chilean miners. Then 1972, The Future of Sex was set in 1972. Uh, education, Education, Education was set in a school in 1997. Last of the Pelican Daughters that we made was, um, or is, in a, in a family home. Um, in sort of mm. at this time, but in a family home, in a real sort of specific environment, That's, and it helps yeah. us to all get hone in, ho yeah, hone in and be on the same page because otherwise we can just flip. That's and really be interesting much. because so for anyone who is collaborating or devising work, having it, it seems to be a balance of having the openness in the rehearsal room to throw all ideas there, but also having something so specific that yeah, acts yeah. as a focus point or a magnet for all of these ideas. Yeah, and I think that's really important to us and actually when we're doing workshops or speaking to young people, we'll often say, um, give yourself something to focus on, give yourself a time period, give yourself a, a very clear place um, just to help you out. Give, mm. you know, again, when we were working in the young company, that often it wasn't about saying, oh, you're completely free to do whatever you want. It was a really nice sense of, Sometimes giving yourself a real set box to work within is really liberating. Like you, you, it frees you up an awful yeah. lot. Um, so it's not, you know, the sort of phrase of thinking outside the box is really, for me at least, and for a lot of people in the wardrobe and someone, not very helpful because that becomes super overwhelming. You've got yeah. no idea what you're going to do. How to ground it. Yeah, how to yeah. ground it. Whereas if you say, this is the time, this is the place, that's where we are, now go and do what you want yeah. and you can explode into different moments and times and places but you know oh we're always coming back here we're always going back to this house or this school or this this date you know yeah. 1972 was set on a very particular day um that david barry appeared on top of the pops and that's right at the start of the show and we know we're always coming back to that day mm -hmm. and it just helps with everything it helps with references it helps with the way people speak it helps with the stuff that you throw in because yeah. you know okay, cool, if someone's going to be drinking something or speaking about something, it's from that time, that place. So. 
And you're all coming back to the same thing together, yeah, otherwise yeah. you might fly off in different directions yeah, as well. Yeah, and it's a danger when you're devising with people that you could all just fly off and do loads of random stuff and then that becomes a point of contention a lot of the mm. time because you all, you've all got carried away with something, mm. which is great. But then if you all get carried away with loads of different strands, that becomes difficult to Piece bring it back time. together, yeah. So we try and give ourselves something to focus on. Yeah. Um, one more thing I want to ask about the wardrobe ensemble is transitions between scenes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because when I was working with them, that was something, it was so complicated and precise. Yeah, yeah. And the transitions were as much a part of the piece as the scenes themselves. And when I saw education, 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 same yeah, thing, the transitions thing, yeah. were so seamless and such an uh, important part of the choreography. Yeah. So how do you approach that? Yeah. Um, I guess we all love, we all love the idea of people seeing a group of people that clearly are sort of in tune with each other. We love, we, we know that's, Oh, we enjoy seeing that when we watch things. You know, it's nice to see people who are really connected on stage. So we really, we we love that sense, and we we like what it looks like, but we like what it feels like as well. We like feeling connected to each other when we're performing, um, and it you know it helps you as an actor. You don't feel on your own and all that kind of stuff. So there's a sort of um, I don't know, not quite the right word, but like an emotional sense to it that is important for us as performers. So, you know, we really don't like the idea of that's the end of a scene, boom, boom, you're into the next scene. There's just like, you know, blackout next scene or whatever. Although we do use that sometimes. Um, we, we just like the sense of connection and sort of meaningful interaction. And um, we know that our audiences really respond to the, the sense that they're watching a group of people that... that that know each other almost and they know how each other move and work mm. and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's, it, it's exciting for people and mm. I think people sort of lean into that. And it helps people really feel connected to the whole, the whole piece. It doesn't, people can't easily in our shows sit back or, or take a breath or turn around and, or, you know, have a you know, handful of crisps or whatever. It's not, it's not easy for people to sort of lull because we're constantly everything means something so we're always trying to yeah you know keep people in so much detail yeah yeah yeah. and you, you want people to have a nice time you know people are paying to watch you people are really committing to to giving you the time so you want you want it to be to to mean something and to be exciting for them mm. like, i think transitions and, and yeah it, it can be really exciting to see stuff you're like well wow cool they like it's a, really like a puzzle. Yeah, I yeah. think a puzzle, when as opposed to having squares, which would be just one scene yeah, yeah. for the next, it all fits together in an mm. unexpected way. Yeah, and, and we, that works with that cohesion yeah. together. And I think it'd be fair to say that we don't really think about them as transitions so much anymore. It's how do we? We you know, we worked with a drama to who who says you know think about the ride of the show, think about how the show feels, what the. Um, if it were a roller coaster, where does it go up? Where does it go down? Where does it turn a corner? Where is it slow? Where is it fast? All this stuff, which has been so helpful for for us, because you know you no longer, you know, if you think about it as a roller coaster, you don't think about a transition between those things. You think how it flows, how you how you slide into that, whether you ride over, whether whether this scene could sit physically next to this scene, whether you could walk into that whether the audience might think, okay, oh, I thought they were walking into the same physical space as that person, but they're in the garden, and, and now I'm watching this, and how do you direct people's focus? It becomes a real um, nice mixture of things that as a group of people, we're going, oh, it'd be nice if we, be nice if we bled that into that moment, and it'd be nice if someone just entered there to, to surprise the audience, or to su surprise the energy, or shift something. And then you sort of catching up, the audience thinks, oh, they bowled into that scene, but they haven't. And then our focus is over here and then that scene just disappears. Mm -hmm. And now this person is really shifted focus. So it, it's, we don't, yeah, I think it'd be fair to say we don't necessarily think about them as transitions anymore. Yeah. We think about them as ways of shifting the tone in, yeah. in things, which is, is a nice way to think about it. Yeah, I think it's such a special part of the way that the show's are devised yeah, and made yeah. up. It's like you said, it keeps your attention yeah. fully engaged all the time. Yeah, you'd hope so. And like for some people, it doesn't work. Some people don't really like that. 
Um, and, you know, that's fair enough. But it's, I think we have a, a particular style that if people engage with, they really, yeah. they really like it. And they, um, they like our shows because of that sort of sense of all, like, leaning in the whole time, which yeah. is nice. So I just want to talk a little bit about the projects you've been working on recently because they're really exciting. Mm. Um, so you've recently been in a film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is now available on Amazon and it's called Cosmos. Cosmos, yeah, yeah, yeah. So tell us a little bit about what that process is like. Is this the first feature length film you've been in? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's like the first sort of meaningful bit of film acting I've done. I've yeah. Done little bits and bobs, but nothing too big. Um, so yeah, that was a feature film made by a couple of brothers called Elliot and Xander. They've got a... Uh, um, production company called Eliander Pictures, which is their names combined, <laughs> uh, which is cool. Awesome. Um, and they they had been making documentaries that had been on sort of National Geographic and um, done really well. So they've made lots of documentaries about space, um, and they they have sort of been doing that for the last few years. And then they wrote a feature film that they wanted to a science fiction feature film that they. Um, they wanted to make and they wanted to they want to move more into making feature films um, and I, I met them a number of years ago um, speak to them they sort of get to, got to know me as a as a person but also knew I did acting as well in a theatre company did screen tests with them and then ended up um, working on this this film with them and it was a great process it was a real different like if we're talking about it as an acting experience it was so cool because it was so different from theatre acting, our theatre company in the way that we've just described is quite fast paced, quite physical, quite big mm. a lot of the time and a lot of the time the characters I play within the wardrobe ensemble are quite um, big yeah, and I enjoy that but it was a real opportunity to shift the style of acting load, it becomes a lot more um, detailed, a lot closer, you don't have to that's, no that's not what I'd say, you, you, you still have to do as much but it's there's something else going on in your head. You, you're aware that the audience, effectively, is the camera and the camera's right here, so you right. don't have to do anything, you know? It's like the person that you're performing for is sat where you are, yeah. so I don't have to be... You know, if, if I was on film moving like this, it's too big. <laughs> I can't be myself. You know? I have to be, like, super small top. <laughs> oh, was, was that intuitive, or did you really have to consciously think okay bring it in yeah no it wasn't intuitive at all because as a character i move a lot and i uh you know get distracted by things and i realize that you have certain tendencies and it's nice to learn it's a learning process i learned that i have my mouth open all the time oh. like genuinely like they would film things and they would have to say to me, shut your mouth shut your mouth, interesting. Shut your mouth. because if i'm interested in something or if i'm get engaged my mouth's just open. Yeah. Like, like, I, then little things like that, you think, that's not going to make a difference. When they first said it to me, I was like, come on, get over it. Like, <laughs> I just have my mouth open. Like, stop telling me to uh, shut my mouth. Was, like, a bit like, okay, fine. But then I looked at it back and I looked <laughs> ridiculous. I went, oh, I'm like, what am I doing? So I was like, thank you so much for having me shut my freaking mouth. So, you have to learn to shut my mouth. You have to learn to be, your eyes to be different. Your eyes have to be um, engaged and alive and bright, um, which I think I do well in the film largely, but there are, there are bits that you watch back and you think, oh, yeah, I, haven't quite, I didn't quite do it there. And the bits I filmed earlier, I haven't quite, my eyes aren't quite alive. And they said loads of cool stuff. Like when we were making it, Elliot and Xander would say, right, your shot now is a, is a close-up shot. We're going to do a pushing shot on your face, or you know we can't see beneath your um, you know chest or whatever. So if you want, do you want to hold something? Like, do you want to hold something so that you're because I'm not speaking. They're just doing a pushing shot on my face. So if you want to hold something, play with something. And they said Harrison Ford in a lot of things holds a, a cloth. He has a cloth the yeah. whole time because he he is just playing with something. So his mind is engaged. His eyes look more alive because he's yeah. thinking about something. Whereas to just say, be alive. That's you such a know, helpful yeah. tip. Yeah, yeah. Also, They're, if you are someone who is quite uh, expressive physically when you are um, thinking about something or yeah, are engaged, yeah. 
to be able to let that tension yeah, go. Yeah, just to think about, like, to physically be doing something yeah. that is small, that's not going to detract from anything, that's not going to yeah. be distracting. So that was really helpful. And just, yeah, like, it was a real good, it was a really good learning experience. And really, a real challenge to try and just be as relaxed as possible, as, um, I don't know, like, sort of shift the way that you spoke a bit more, just get comfortable with the words. How does the voice change? Um... For me, actually, I struggle quite a lot when I'm performing in theatre. I, I haven't ever been properly trained. I didn't go to drama school, I didn't do any of that. So a lot of the time I struggle because I speak quite quiet. I speak quite quietly, weirdly, when I'm on stage. Really? Yeah, yeah, which is weird. Yeah. It's, well, I don't, I don't, my tendency is to want to do that. Um, so I will sometimes overcompensate for that. And I, I'm, I'm not great at projecting. So like we did, um, we did education, education, education it, on the West End, and constantly I would have to be being told like, be careful of your voice, be careful of your voice. You're not quite, you're not quite projecting. You're growling. I get the note all the time. You're growling. You're growling and growling. And it's not unkind. It's it's a really helpful note to get yeah. me just to remind me like I'm I project from my throat, right? Not from my chest. I I I try, but I'm not very. I haven't quite honed that skill. Yeah. I never it's quite learned how to do it. Habit, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's yeah. not a habit. So doing the film was a lot easier for me because I didn't I didn't have to think so much about the nature of my voice. I could mm. I didn't have to think about my voice as something sort of physical. I could just think about it as um I could think about it differently. I I wasn't worried about it in the same kind mm. of way. Um and they would tell me, you know, it's nice because the first film we did, we were all aware that a lot, of, it was the first time we were all acting on film. So we were just really open with it. It's like, if I'm not doing quite right, if I'm not being quite yeah. right. Because the, the other thing that is a risk with that is that you can murmur a lot and you can slide over your yeah. words because you're, you have in your mind, just be, just be natural, have your natural tone, natural volume. But when you do that, you can just go blah, blah, blah. like you can just slide the into gets the clarity lost. gets lost. So you, yeah. you have to be careful on that. Um, and again, they would just say that and we just reshoot it. But I think the more and more film stuff I do, hopefully, that will become a, a, an easier habit of being clearer yeah. with what I'm doing. Because I ten I again have a tendency to just sort of bleed stuff in. I get that note in theatre loads. Like mm. you're, clarity you're is such an important yeah. thing for. I guess those intimate moments yeah, are also yeah. for projection. Yeah, yeah. Rather clarity than just thinking just... about breadth or the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the volume, clarity yeah. can make a really large difference. Yeah, and it's a good question to ask because I don't really think about my voice very much like when I'm thinking about a character or thinking about what I'm doing. Because like I said, I haven't been like trained. Mm. That's never been part of a training or anything yeah. for me. So I never, if I'm honest, I never really think about my voice. I just think about what I'm doing. I think about things very physically what I look like, how I'm moving, whether that's engaging. And I rely on that quite a lot. Um, so the, the question of you know, what's different about a voice, I don't, I don't know really, I'm just sort of speaking differently. <laughs> I'm, I'm just trying to be yeah. as good as I can be. But I think for other people, they probably think about it very consciously yeah. and do a really great job. But I guess for you, you have that um, need to project is taken away from you. So yeah, which is more lot, relaxed. Yeah, I feel a lot more, I felt really relaxed. It was really nice. I, Thinking, okay, I don't need that worry is taken away. I can just yeah, just talk as as I do. Yeah, which is nice. So one of the things that you um, painted this picture of how it was on set is that it was very communicative. Yeah, yeah. Very open about um, if a shot wasn't working mm -hmm. or if, if it was your first time in that situation. How important do you think that level of communication is between castmates and a crew? Yeah. I think it's really important. I, it was, I think I'm always going to say that because I'm used to working quite collaboratively in theatre. Like that's my starting point, mm. and I like that. I like being really open. I like speaking to each other about things that are working, things that aren't working. I like being honest about that. I like people saying, "Oh, that's not quite. We haven't quite got that." There. And knowing that it's not spiteful, they're not saying that for any. There's no ill will in that. I like being told when yes. things are working and when things aren't working. Yeah. Um, so I love that and I love that with the film. Um, but I'm also aware that that's not always possible. So if there's people who are going into you know, theatre environments or 
you know, acting in short films or films for the first time, I, I would actually probably just encourage people to be super curious of the process. Mm. You, you know, everyone to a certain extent has foibles or things they're nervous about. A director's inclination might not be to make you feel super comfortable. You might not have cast members you get on really well with. Yeah. But if you can cultivate a sort of curiosity about the people around you, but also the process, if you can learn why there's a light here to light that side of your face and a light behind you to frame you nicely, if you know why they're pushing in and what they're looking for there, you feel more comfortable and you can respond differently to that. It doesn't become intimidating, you don't clam up. Mm. If you just have a curiosity about everything that's going on, it becomes an exciting an exciting process yeah. because essentially all that anyone's trying to do is just tell a story in the same way you did when you were a little kid, you know. Like yeah. that's what you're all that's what everyone's aiming to do. So if you can just have the same level of excitement and curiosity as you would have when you were, you know, yeah. messing about with your mates as a little kid, then that's that's the sort of thing you would that is the ideal feeling. Um incidentally that takes your focus off of yourself. Yeah, yeah. As well. Yeah, big time. And I think that's a really important thing. Like the wardrobe ensemble we we're good at that, I would say, of not focusing too much on yourself. Like I described, we're very aware of other people, how we're moving in relation to other people, how we're thinking in relation to other people. We're thinking outside of ourselves an awful lot and that's very, very, very helpful. In film, it's harder to do that because, you know, you might shoot a scene four or five times and, you know, one time the two people you're supposed to be acting to might be in a completely different place to what you've been asked to play. Right. You might be, you know, looking over here as if you're looking at another character and they're actually stood over there saying their lines so it's harder because you're yeah. thinking oh to a certain extent you're thinking oh what am I you're thinking what do I look like and am I looking nice you know well I was <laughs> 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 maybe some people are uh, I was thinking like am I looking am I looking right uh, because there is maybe in it's film there's a lot artificial. more about the way you look like, yeah. there really is and the setup's artificial yeah it's artificial you, you're lit they, they do like you to try and make you look as good as possible so you're very aware of the fact that you're a bit you're a bit more of a commodity you right, know? It's okay. a, you're a bit more of a thing yeah sort of moving about <laughs> <laughs> you feel like that or you, you, you can feel like that if you're not careful yeah. so you just you got to do your best not to worry about that I suppose it's a funny thing I watched a film the other day and I was like this is a weird process and the people I was watching it with friends of mine friends of ours my wife and I was like, they were saying um, like, how does it feel watching yourself and I was like weird because I think I look fat and then I, was, I said that and I was like, that's a weird thing. Really? Like, that's a weird... Well, I, it actually isn't weird because you're essentially looking at yourself for two hours. If you stood in front of a mirror for a long time, I'm sure you'd find things about yourself yeah. that you felt uncomfortable about. Yeah. Um, or I would, definitely. So it's an interesting process. And it's, an, it's understandable as to why a lot of actors have a lot of self doubt, right. Like image... Super image conscious. Yeah. It's a different thing when a friend watches something and they're seeing everything that's been edited together whereas when you the actor watch it you remember how you were actually feeling in that moment yeah, yeah, yeah. what's going through your head what's going through your head and what's happening and you're thinking like oh it's, it's a memory yeah so it's a weird <laughs> thing and it, you know the longer the longer the amount of time between shooting something and watching it i really enjoyed watching it on the weekend because we filmed it like two or three years ago or whatever so I can't remember all those things. I right. can't, particularly because my memory is really bad. I'm just objective. forgotten. So I'm just watching it and being like, oh, and it's nice. You're able, years later, to go, oh, you've done a good job. Like, yeah. you've done well there. And not feel that not be arrogance or that not be anything else. It, it, it's a lot more objective where you can look at it and go like, oh, no, I should be happy with what I've done there. Like, yeah. And it takes you a long time to get to that point because... Up until now, every time I've watched it, I've thought, like, what are they thinking? What's that person right. thinking who's watching it? Like, oh, I could have done better there. Because I have a memory of what I could have done differently. Yes. Because when you're filming something, you're thinking, I've got a few options here. And you do one, and then you might do something slightly differently. And then you'll think, oh, I wonder which one they'll pick. Uh -huh. And they'll pick a different one. Or they'll pick the one that they like, that you might not like. So then you'll watch the film and you'll think, oh, I think I did a better one of those. Or you'll think, 
I never quite got that line right. I never quite got that right. Yeah. So you're thinking about it the whole time thinking there was a better one in me. Yeah. But the longer the time goes by, you look at it and you're like, it doesn't matter if there was a better one in me. That one's good enough. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. That one still communicates something quite truthfully and nicely and it helps and works in the scene. So you watch it and you think, oh no, that, that's, that works. Like, that's nice. So it's a weird, it's a weird process. It's a, it's a shift from such a fluid process yeah. In making devising theatre, yeah, where things are constantly different. changing and scenes are being tweaked, to having a finite, singular outcome. Yeah, it is, and yeah, being this, it's been an interesting process to have that, and to have a real finite, a really finite pro product, if you like. You know, you can buy it on DVD. You know, yeah. It's like in all this stuff, you're like, wow, that's really cool I love that and I love that there's a thing you have something tangible captured. Yeah. yeah and you know if I have kids or if I have grandkids all that kind of stuff I'll be able to go like this was a thing I did mm. and it's, that's I love that I love the idea that they'll be able to see that and I'll hopefully I'll do more and more of that that they'll get physical things that they can go oh that's someone I know like, that's yeah. a nice I like that idea um, but also it's you know, if you're not careful, if you don't reflect on it in the right kinds of ways, you can, you know, feel not bad about yourself, but you can overanalyze things. The critic. And, yeah, and you can really, like, yeah. niggle at yourself, which isn't, you know, it's not helpful for anyone. Least of all you, you just, yeah. like, you know, knocks your confidence down. Are you able to watch it now as a whole film? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I did on the weekend. Yeah. I loved it. It was really nice. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I was not, I wasn't just watching me. I wasn't, you know, picking the faults with the film. I wasn't doing any of that. Because we've all, all the people who made the film, we spoke about it a lot. We went to the premiere together. We had like a real nice premiere in LA and we were super excited about it. And we did that and then it was released on Amazon Prime. And then, and then we started getting loads of reviews through online. And there were some that were like, absolutely love it. People loving it. And by and large, the vast majority of people love it. Like or, or like it, you know. Uh, but you do get super negative things being said to you and real things that really are aimed to make you feel bad the, about the film, about the acting, about the way it's cut, about the pacing. And for a time, we were all like quite, not upset about it, but it, it does affect you. And you think, oh no, like, crikey, maybe it should have been shorter wow. or maybe I could have been better. But then I, I was chatting to one of the directors on the weekend and I said, oh, I watched it and I loved it. And I felt like re I could watch it really objectively and really enjoy it and in context and all that. And he was like, yeah, mate, I've watched it recently and just loved it. And I just didn't want bothered about what people said mm -hmm. about it. I was just really proud of it. So that's nice. It's nice to be able to get to that point. Yeah. And have taken the learning from it and go like, next time, maybe it might be cut differently. From their perspective, they might cut it differently. Yeah. They might shoot things slightly differently. They will have undoubtedly learned stuff. From me, I will have learned things about how I can perform and what works nicely on film and all that. So I will change things when I do things yeah. next. But you are still allowed to be content with the thing you've done. Yeah. Like, that's allowed. So the fluidity comes through from the growth, which yeah, you then yeah. put you, onto the next project. Yeah, you yeah. go through it and go like, cool, that's, I've learned from that and I'll do something slightly differently. But I'm happy with that. Yeah. Yeah. In the same way as the wardrobe, I was like, well, we, we would never make we probably would never make a show like Riot or 33 again because we think we've improved the things yeah. that we do may maybe or shifted how we do things or the process by which we make stuff. But we nevertheless should look at those things and be proud of what we did yeah. because that was a moment in our lives where that was as best as we could do. It's also the stepping stones to yeah. get you to where, well, now we were talking about this before we started this um, chat about the just doing things yeah, you know and not worrying out, about them being yeah. perfect and how you don't you don't can't get to that yeah, yeah. space where you want to be unless you do things and try yeah. things out which which might not suit you after a while yeah it might not suit you that you might not be the best person in the world that you might but it's a case of going like this is as as best as i can do or i'm doing this as well as i know how to right now and just being content with yeah. that. And that's, that's a difficult thing to do. It's a difficult thing to cultivate. But, you know, it just makes you realise, well, as long as I do everything I'm doing fully. Yes, yeah. Well, that means right now, I should, I should be able to look at myself and go, well, like, well done. Yeah. 
you know, you're giving it a good crack. Um, and not be too nitpicky and not, not look at other people and go, wow, they're way further ahead than me, or they're bloody great. Look at them and go, how do, I, how, how do they do that thing? That, yeah. That's a cool thing. Good curiosity. That's a real nice thing that they're doing. I wonder how they do that. Because we're all human. We all have the capacity to learn how to do stuff. Like. Mm. So we can all get better at the things we're doing. I think it's just not listening to the voice that tells you you're not there yet. Mm. Like that's, and that's a freaking loud voice all the time in the arts especially for anyone who's trying to do things and there'll probably be people who watch this who are watching it because they want to learn yeah. stuff and you know I hope that's from a place of curiosity and not feeling like oh I'm not there yet because yeah. it's like well, because what know, is yeah, it's what's an the intangible <laughs> thing and yeah, what yeah. you can produce is going to be completely unique yeah. to you which yeah, yeah isn't what might be out there or and it's cool and will yeah. lead to things that people have never thought about it's, it's, uh, it's nice yeah well thank you so much yeah. for sharing nice. all of your <laughs> it was nice <laughs> <laughs> that was nice that was nice thing. <laughs> but for sharing all your expertise about the devising process it's I think so so wonderful to get that insight into how it all works and to hear how that transition was for you into film thank you for sharing yeah. all of that with us and we've got the wardrobe ensemble, the email address, which is just the wardrobe ensemble at gmail.com. We encourage loads of people if they've got questions about devising theatre or whatever, just like, email that. And we'll yeah. do it, it won't be me who replies, I'm terrible at replying to stuff, but there's um, people in the company who like keep an eye on that and will we'll respond to that. Oh, in amazing. Like, ways. And you know, if you have questions and things, or are curious about how we do stuff or whether we have workshops coming up and all that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, because you do conduct workshops. With yeah, you. we've got yeah. quite a lot coming up in the next few months and, well, we're, we're doing more and more and more of that because we're, we're trying to um, improve our, the sort of outreach stuff that we do. Oh, awesome. Um, so Emily, who's part of the company, is sort of heading up all of the outreach stuff that we're doing. So we will be doing more and more workshops and bits and pieces. So like definitely that, so. worth emailing to see, yeah, yeah. just to get some advice, to see if there's a workshop on you yeah. that you can go to. And looking at the website and stuff. So. Yeah. And the new show is, when's it next on? It's cool. You've got Riot on next week. We've got Riot on next week in Bristol, at the Bristol Old Vic. Um, so that is, what's, what date is that? February, uh, the whatever. Beginning of February. Yeah, <laughs> sometime in February. Yeah. Um, so we've got that coming up and then we're going straight on tour. Um, for the last of the Pelican Daughters, which is what we did in Edinburgh, and we're touring this spring. So. Is it a UK tour? Yes, we're going to loads of different places. We're going to Bristol, Northampton, London, Aberystwyth, Warwick. Oh, amazing. Covent, like, like a, load, a load of different places. Um, and then I think we're, we might be touring, um, I think I could say, a, a, like education, education, education. I think the intention is for us to hopefully tour that later on in the year again across the UK. So. so would that all be on the website? So I'll put a link to the website as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Most of that will be on the website. I don't know about tours later on in the year because they're not confirmed by yeah. any means. But the the tour, the imminent tours and stuff, that's all on the website. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then the film is on Amazon Prime. Yeah, the film's on Amazon Prime. Cosmos. Cosmos. I'll put a link yeah. to that as well. Yeah, yeah. It's on Amazon Prime. And yeah, you can also buy it on DVD. There we go. Um, so yeah, you can you can catch that and yeah, enjoy that as well. Awesome, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, see you next time. Cheers. Bye.